Hello, my name is Dan Minkler. I work at Merck in the Chemical Engineering Research and Development Department at the Merck Rahway facility. Thanks for listening in today to this webinar, and thanks for Mettler for the opportunity to record and present the webinar to you all. This presentation today will be about an interesting wet milling during crystallization process that we've developed and scaled up and is currently being used for one of our drug substances. So before we dive into all the data and everything, I want to give a little bit of background on the process so you can get more of a feel for what it is that we're doing and why we're doing it. So the drug substance, uh, otherwise known as the API, that we're making needs to be a sterile dry powder. This is because it's going to be used as an injectable. The thing that makes this project kind of unique and kind of challenging is that this sterile dry powder is going to be blended with two other sterile powders as well as a sterile excipient. Due to this blending of these sterile dry powders, we really need to think about the content uniformity of the blend. So that led us to think, well, what particle size and what morphology do we need to achieve in order to get a, a uniform blend? The way our final drug product is made is once all these powders are blended, it's that, that blend is dispensed straight into uh, the vials on the filling line. So it's, you know, it's really important that each vial is going to have XYZ percent of the different APIs, uh, you know, to a fairly tight tolerance. So a question that you might have at this point is, well, why not just fill the solids individually, you know, fill solid one, fill solid two, fill solid three, etc. cetera. Uh, and that, that would definitely make our lives easier. But the issue is really the footprint on the metering floor to have three individual sterile fillers. It's just it would be very cumbersome and very expensive so it's it's easier just to have a lot easier just to have a, a blend and that blend be distributed into into the vial so you only have to use you know one filler getting back to particle size if you look at the bo bottom left of the slide you can see this is our this was our initial blend assessment for how well the blend performed on the y axis is the percent RSD or relative standard deviation on the x-axis is particle size and on the y-axis is blending time. As you can see, you can see we kind of had issues at either end of the spectrum, really large and really small particles. At the upper end of the range, 280, 300 microns, initially the powder wasn't well blended and even after some time it still wasn't very blended and that percent RSD is the higher it is, the worse, which means the varying concentrations in the different samples, um, the varying concentrations of our drug substance in, in the different in the different samples, and you know at the bottom end of the range, uh, around the thirty micron, there was an initial uh, evidence of good blending, but as the blend continued, it deblended. So there was a risk of deblending at the low end and just not blending at all at the high end. So based on this data, we identified a range of greater than 30, 35 microns and less than 85 microns as kind of an ideal range for, for where we want to be with our, our particle size. Jump, jumping quickly to the solution that we developed to, to achieve this particle size range, and I already touched on this a little bit on the intro slide, is we developed this wet milling during crystallization process that is scalable and repeatedly gets us right in the particle size range that, that we want. So on this slide I just want to give an overview of what the presentation is going to contain. We just talked about the API and process background a bit and uh, next I'm going to talk about what crystallization strategies have been explored and why we chose wet milling. Uh, and I realize I've been using the term wet milling. If, if you're not familiar with that term, it's, it's rotor stator milling that I'm referring to. Uh, and later on in the presentation, on the second half, we're going to talk about really the characterization work. And then we'll conclude with 
how the characterization work allowed us to to successfully scale up and what that scale up data looks like. I'm going to quickly run through the different crystallization techniques that we evaluated during development. Uh, we looked at different modes of anti-solvent addition, forward addition, reverse addition, simultaneous addition. Uh, we m manipulated a lot of variables in all of these addition uh, during development, such as temperature of the crystallization, anti-solvent addition rate, whether we seed or, or not seed, as well as, as other key variables. And the, the main takeaway I want to give you from, from all this development work was that traditional crystallization techniques didn't give us the particle size that we were looking for. Uh, however, the forward addition was the most promising. Uh, I'm not going to get into too many details, but with, there were some issues with the other modes of addition, such as reverse addition. We were getting small particles, which was great, but they were needle-like, which showed a blending risk, so we couldn't use those. Use those. Um, and from the forward addition, as you can see in this picture, over to the right of the slide, we, we the big takeaway from that was that these particles really like to grow. You can see a lot of these particles in this picture are over 200 microns long. So we're getting very large particles and these large particles wouldn't suit the blend that we were trying to make. However, the morphology of the forward addition particles, as you can see in the picture, they're kind of blocky, showed promise in blending. So this is why we pursued the forward addition anti technique. So now let's talk about why wet milling or rotor stator milling was chosen. At this point, we had our key problem statement we can't control the particle size well enough with traditional crystallization techniques so how do we how do we get to this particle size range 30 35 to 85 microns that we want our first thought was to do dry powder milling let's create these particles once we have the dry powders we'll just mill them down using either jet milling or pin milling however as we looked at the risks involved with these unit operations they were risks that were too large that we didn't want to take. So one of the risks was the possibility of generating amorphous material, which we wanted to avoid considering this is our final API. We want it all crystalline material. And the other is a dehydration concern. Uh, our final API is actually a monohydrate. And to do these sort of milling operations sterilely, there's a lot of sterile dry nitrogen that's used, which had the risk of dehydrating this monohydrate. Once we ruled dry powder milling out, we thought, well, let's just do wet milling or rotor stator milling after the crystallization, which is the standard way in which rotor stator mills are used for crystallization. You you generate your particles, then you, you terminally rotor slim down to your target particle size. By using terminal rotor stator milling, we would be able to avoid the key risks that were identified with dry powder milling. And for those of you who aren't too familiar with rotor stator mills, uh, the picture on the right of the screen uh, is what a pilot scale scale rotor stator mill looks like. And the two gear looking items uh, on the left, the smaller piece is called the rotor. And on the right, that larger piece is the stator. So the stator stays still and the rotor spins and these are at very high rpms and and that mechanism that shearing mechanism of of the spinning uh, rotor gives you your particle size reduction through through shear force so how did this terminal wet milling approach work well when we tried it at lab scale it was awesome it was repeatedly getting us right in the particle size range that we wanted, 30 to 85 microns. If you look in the right side of the slide, that's the a typical parts distribution from one of these terminal wet milling runs in lab. Uh, mean size is around 61 microns, so you know, right, right in our target range. You might notice in this particle size distribution that there's a bit of a fines tail. Um, overall, it's fairly unimodal, but towards the left side, the small 
size particles. There's a bit of a tail there. Uh, that This wasn't too much of a concern to us, but keep it in mind, I'll come back to it later in the presentation. So what happened when we took this to manufacturing scale? Unfortunately, we had major problems. Uh, at the end of the crystallization, when we opened up the bottom drain valve on the crystallizer to flow wet mill, those large particles that we generated during the forward addition crystallization plugged the line going to the wet mill. This actually happened twice at manufacturing scale. And at this point of the process, we're within the sterile and aseptic boundaries. So any manufacturing is issue is a nightmare and a half. Uh, there's really no recourse that you can take when you're with when you're within the aseptic boundaries. So we wanted to avoid this at all costs, and we needed to figure out a different approach to getting our target particle size. Let's briefly recap where we stand with the process. Um, so traditional crystallization techniques don't give us the particle size that we want. And also traditional final particle size reductions are either too risky, such as the dry powder milling, or pose issues at manufacturing scale, such as the terminal wet milling. So if we can't process large particles, then how do we prevent these particles from growing too large in the first place? The idea we came up with was to wet mill during the crystallization, perhaps if we continuously milled during the anti-sulfate addition, we could prevent the those particles from ever getting so large in the first place. Uh, and the general approach to this was to start the anti-solvent addition and during the entirety of the anti-solvent addition recircul recirculate the batch through a wet mill uh, in, in a continuous fashion as seen in the schematic. Let's take a look now at the initial assessment of this approach. Well, when we tried this idea out at small scale, we had success, which is great, uh, but we were a little cautiously optimistic because, you know, we've seen success before. Uh, but with this approach, um, it looked very promising. So we got right in the 30 to 85 micron particle size range that we're looking for. Uh, if you look at the particle size distribution on the right of the slide, uh, the mean size we got from from these initial experiments was around 57 microns, which is you know right on target, which is great. We also had this really nice unimodal distribution, as you can see, uh, and there's there was no fines tail that we had seen from the terminal milling, which was a, an added bonus. Um, so now now that we you know had some initial success, it looks like proof of concept. We had to be confident that we could also do this at scale and really understand how this is working. As we start talking more about the data that we collected, uh, I want to just quickly talk about the the approach that we took and, and with how to run these experiments in lab. Uh, so the crystallization that I'm talking to you about today uh, is done uh, with an anti-solvent addition over three hours, uh, and that's at a constant anti-solvent addition rate. And for these experiments, the interesting thing that we had to, to work around was how to compare the mill uh, or a rotor stator mill at small scale and at large scale, uh, since it's a little bit tricky to, to scale down, mainly, mainly because the wet mill acts essentially as a centrifugal pump, and use centrifugal pumps, you know, they're great at scaling up, not necessarily so great at scaling down, because uh, they, they tend to like to pump pretty fast, so it's hard to get below a certain minimum flow rate. Uh, and so at, this, at scale, our thought was to we would be running the mill continuously throughout the entire anti-solvent addition. However, if we did that at lab, even with the smallest rotor stator mill available, we would be putting 20 more volume or 20 times the volumes that we would at manufacturing scale. Uh, so we thought this wasn't wouldn't be very representative. So what we went with with was a turnover approach. Is was our hypothesis, and that's uh, the formula I have here is basically the mill recycle flow rate times the the time of milling uh, divided by the batch volume uh, which is basically saying the amount of volume gone through the mill versus the batch volume uh, and we thought th the best way to try to approximate this is 
to calculate how many turnovers we would get at scale if we ran it continuously and then to match that at lab scale we implemented a intermittent milling approach so we would mill for you know x amount of time and then pause and then restart the mill milling uh, as a way to to approximate the turnovers we would get at scale I'll also quickly mention, if you're not familiar with them already, two pieces of uh, technology that were pretty useful during the development and characterization work that we did, and that's the particle track and particle view probe technologies. The particle track is pretty nice because it essentially gives you a sort of real-time particle size distribution, uh, which is good to know how your experiment is going before you, you know, have to wait to isolate your solids and get that data back. And also the particle view, which is pretty neat it's like kind of like having a GoPro in your reactor and can kind of help give some insight as to, to what's going on when you actually see these these particles growing and such so here is what we saw when we first started diving in and characterizing this rotor stator milling during crystallization um, here I'll show you some particles track data. I think it's a really useful way to look at to look at what was going on. It's kind of how we started looking at this. As you're looking at the graph down below, what you're seeing on the y-axis is the total number of particles in the system, and this is counting particles from as small as one micron up to a thousand microns. So it's just a summation total particle count, and on the x-axis that is just time. And on the x-axis, you'll see these orange sort of triangles. I hope you, you can kind of make them out. And that denotes where a mill cycle occurred. Uh, and I think for this experiment, it was something on the order of we would mill for one minute and then turn the mill on off. And then when you see the next orange triangle, that's we would turn it on again for a minute and turn off and so on and so forth. Um, so what we saw from, from this is, is two major things is there was this nucleation event that I've circled there, which after the second mill cycle, we had a large growth in the number of particles in the system. And then after that, we saw these jumps in the total particle count. Just every time the mill would be turned on, we would see a spike in the particle count. I'll first focus on the nucleation event that I highlighted in the previous slide. Here I've zoomed in on the trend that we were just looking at in that previous slide. Uh, at the beginning, we have our anti-solvent addition beginning. Then at, so in this experiment, milling was done every 10 minutes. So 10 minutes into the crystallization, we had the first mill cycle. And we see this blip, and I'll kind of uh, highlight this a little bit more in the, in the slides coming up. Um, but we were pretty sure that this is uh, due to bubbles being induced by the mill. So whenever you start the mill, uh, it does does bring a lot of bubbles into the system, which which can affect the probe and the reading. So we, we were pretty confident it was that. Then between the first and second where things start to get interesting, um, in between this, you start to see a, a growth in the in the total number of particle counts. Then once you hit that second mill cycle, you really see the a kind of nucleation shower happen. There's a large increase in the amount of particles, as you can see on the trend. We reran this same experiment several times and found it to be a very reproducible effect, which was very interesting because without milling, if you just do the a typical anti-solvent addition over the three hours, um, at the constant anti-solvent addition rate, you'll see it self-nucleate. However, this doesn't happen until about 40 minutes or maybe even a little bit longer. With the mill, this is only 20 minutes into the anti-solvent addition. So we're really seeing evidence that the mill is inducing nucleation. Here I'll show a couple slides of videos during this these first couple mill cycles that help really complete the story that we're saying and um, hopefully this will loop here while, while I'm talking. So this is just the beginning of the anti-solvent addition before that first mill cycle. I'm um, just showing this. This is kind of the background and our noise. You know, whenever you have agitation, there's always going to be some, some bubbles and disturbances. So that's kind of what we're seeing in the background here.
Here now we'll look at the first mill cycle and as, as this loops you can see that when the mill gets turned on is when you start seeing these very large bubbles and disturbances come in and seeing this helped us further believe that you know these as a part to just visual ob observation in the actual reactor that this was a result of that blip was a result of all these bubbles being brought in by the mill now as I loop the in between the first two milling cycles video you see during during this progression hopefully you can make this out uh, the growth some sizable particles actually by by the end of the video uh, at first you see there's there's a couple bright spots which are the actual particles like small nuclei and then we see them start to grow through this video over over that course of 10 minutes in the video for during the second mill cycle you can really see the visual side of the story to what uh, the trend showed us of that nucleation shower as we hit the second mill cycle uh, you really start to see a large number of small nuclei and just small particles being generated during this cycle uh, you can see the the field of, of vision starts getting very crowded with all these particles um, and after the second mill cycle here on loop we start to see you start to see actually uh, some growth just in between those 10 minutes uh, as I mentioned earlier earlier these particles really like to grow and this video just really highlights that you can even start to see some possible uh, agglomeration happening in solution uh, so this is building on on that bed of particles created by the mill Here we can look at some still photographs, which are nice as well to, to get an understanding of what's going on uh, during these events. So on the left we have uh, in between mill cycles one and two, uh, which is where we first start to see uh, particles present in the system. And you'll see here this it's kind of sparse, but there's some small and large particles present. And once you get on the right into mill cycle two, which is where we see that nucleation shower, you really start to see, obviously, many, many particles, a lot of small nuclei, small particles present, as well as in, in both of these images, you see some larger particles. Um, and you know, I've already mentioned this before in the presentation, really a testament to how quickly and large these particles can grow um, and just at, in, at a really fast rate. If you look at in between mill cycles one and two, that's this is just minutes after we first start getting nucleation in the system and first start seeing particles. So that's pretty substantial uh, the thing and it's great visualization here. All this data we've looked at surrounding the nucleation event is really suggesting uh, two key things and that's that we have these two different nucleation phenomena occurring. Uh, there's one in that that happens at kind of mill cycle one and really materializes in between those mill cycles where we have a nucleation event in the absence of particles or nuclei so kind of a primary nucleation event and then then in the presence of particles and nuclei we kind of have this secondary nucleation event where we really generate our seed bed so to speak our, our bed of particles Now we'll talk about what happens when we mill after these nucleation events. When people have studied rotor stator wet milling, it's usually been in the focus of terminal milling, which I talked about earlier, which is after you've done the crystallization and you have your particles, you mill them down to a certain target size that you want. And this happens through two major mechanisms, uh, massive fracture and attrition. So if you look at the pink, uh, purpley particles, um, that's showing massive fracture. And that's where you have a particle and you really kind of exactly the namesake, massive fracture. You break it into large pieces, either by breaking it in half or in course. Uh, 
um, and the that really gives you your largest particle size reduction, um, your largest drop, as you see in that graph. And then attrition is where you're kind of chipping away at a particle, as you see in these in these blue blocks, uh, kind of cutting off little edges. Not as much of a particle size reduction, but a smaller one. And that leads us to the question of, well, what's happening in our case since we're not really doing terminal milling? Now let's revisit the particle size trend data that we were looking at previously. Uh, we're, we were looking at the 1 to 1,000 microns or the total number of particles. Um, we're looking at the same data except I've broken it out now into different buckets. So the red uh, trend that you see is fine particles, so 10 microns and under. And the purple trend is 50 to 150 micron particles, so rather larger particles. And I've highlighted each mill cycle that we initiate. So every time we initiate a mill cycle, we see this distinct increase in fines and decrease in large particles. And that's kind of intuitive. It makes sense, right? We're milling. We should be getting rid of larger particles and creating smaller ones. So that's exactly what we're seeing here, which is kind of nice to see the visual representation of that. And then if you notice, after that mill cycle is initiated and and then stopped, you see in the fines trend a decrease in the count of fines as well as a concurrent increase in the amount of large particles. So as we stop milling, some of these fine particles either redissolve into solution or, or grow, which takes them out of that particle size range, no longer counted as fines. And we see sort of the opposite happening in the large particle count trend where some particles are growing and are starting to be counted in the new 50 to 150 micron bucket. However, this doesn't quite answer the question that we just raised where we're asking, well, is this attrition or massive fracture? Because this phenomena we would expect to see in both scenarios. Now in this slide, I've added another trend to the graph that we've been looking at, and that's the mean particle size, which you can see in the green. Um, and if, you, if you're looking at this in the very beginning, so this is this this graph is looking um, from the beginning to the end of the anti-solvent addition and on all the mill cycles in between. In the beginning, before we have a large amount of particles, the software, so this is using the particle track uh, software, it doesn't have a great estimate of what the mean size is because there's not a large amount of particles to draw from. But as you can see, as it as it levels out, what we're seeing is really a fluctuation between maybe 45 and 50 microns uh, each time there's a mill cycle. And this is kind of a key point here. Uh, this is really suggesting that the mill is not providing massive fracture during the crystallization. This is likely large. Now, it's hard to say exactly what's happening in maybe those first couple of mill cycles where our, uh, the this trend is, isn't really resolved yet. However, by and large, throughout the majority of, of this three-hour crystallization, we're really seeing only small fluctuations in that particle size. So it, it's really looking like we have attrition here. And this kind of also ties into a point earlier when I mentioned that when we did the terminal wet milling versus, versus the rotor stator milling, where in the terminal we had the fines tail, and we didn't, uh, when we had the, when we did it via wet milling, this is because we're still super saturated during the anti-solvent addition here, whereas at the if you do the milling at the end of the crystallization, if you generate fines, you don't really have the opportunity to grow those again because you're, you're, there's, you're, there's very little super saturation left in the system. But if you do it during the crystallization, you can grow those fines that you create through milling. And I believe that's what we're seeing here.
Uh, now that we've investigated what happens during that nucleation event that we see and during the milling cycles after the nucleation, let's try to pull together and figure out what actually controls particle size so we can be smart when we're thinking about scaling this up. I want to quickly recap now and see what we know at this point. So we've investigated that nucleation event and found that that's a very repeatable event that the mill induces nucleation. We've also seen that when we keep milling past that nucleation event, what we primarily see is an attrition effect. So now let's ask the question, well, which of these effects really controls our particle size? Is it is it mostly the attrition effect of the constant attrition on particles? Does it have more to do with the nucleation event? Or is it a combination of both? We came up with an idea to try to decouple these two things and, and try to pinpoint what exactly was going on. We thought, well, what if we only mill during the first hour of the anti-Selvin addition? Again, we typically do this over three hours and mill that entire time. So what, what if we stopped milling an hour into it? Uh, and I'll skip to the data. So when we mill during the entirety of the anti-Selvin addition, we see around maybe 57, 57.3 microns uh, final particle size. When we did the mill only during the first hour, which is only 33%, of the anti-solvent addition, we ended up with 59.7 microns, which really just isn't a large change at all. So this was pretty eye-opening and led us to the hypothesis that what's really happening here, what's really controlling our final particle size is the surface area that we create by milling, by inducing that massive nucleation event is likely giving us our particle size reduction because we're providing such a large amount of surface area for for growth and on the right side of the slide here this is some solubility data that or substration data that I obtained during the during a crystallization at different points during the anti-solvent addition and we can see here that at one hour into the anti-solvent addition that we already have 70 percent of the mass at a solution and this helps kind of complete the picture and helps both hypothesis here is we're, we're driving mass out of the solution very quickly with due to our relatively quick anti-solvent addition so that all that mass is getting deposited on a larger number of, of particles than what would be present if the the batch or if the crystallization spontaneously nucleated when we mill we we generate all these particles so all that mass can get deposited over a larger bed and I don't have the exact data in here but this is what we saw with experiments early on in development where we looked at seeding and if we pushed in a relatively large seed bed of small particles we could see a decrease in our final particle size We can also look at this visually with the particle size data trends and after that first hour we see a decrease in fines and an increase in large particles but if you look at the mean particle size count it does not really increase all that much so it's showing our, our particle size is, re is really locked in fairly early in the process. Now I'll uh, briefly mention some ongoing and further studies that we're looking at with this process. One of the things that's difficult to really identify with the process because they're kind of concurrent is whether or not the nucleation that the mill is providing is mainly a function of the shear effect on the fluid genera generating particles because we sort of see that when I was showing that first mill cycle and, and we start we see a little bit of particle growth early on it looks like there's evidence that there's shear induced nucleation based on fluid shear um, but then later on it becomes difficult to say well do 
we have more nucleation because there's more supersaturation, and so there's more of an effect of the fluid shear in generating um, more particles, or is it more of an attrition effect where we're causing attrition on particles, and that's generating more second particles for growth? Um, to try to look at this, we designed uh, an experiment using tangential flow filtration. With this setup, we were able to divert a recirculating stream around the crystallizer uh, to put only fluid through the mill, so it was able to separate any particles from going into the mill. And I'll show you some of the data here uh, on the right side. Um, when we don't mill at all, uh, if we just let it spontaneously nucleate and continue the crystallization that way, we see about 206 microns uh, as our final particle size. Uh, when we do the typical runs that I've been describing where we mill throughout the process, um, we get around 60 microns as our final particle size. When I did this experiment where I milled for three hours but I only milled the fluid and not any particles, we, s we got around 125 microns. So it's def definitely smaller than with uh, no milling present at all. So there's clearly some effect of shear induced nucleation on the fluid. Um, however, this is a non-trivial trivial experiment to run. We had a lot of issues with fouling and small particles do get caught in the filter. So that's effectively taking away surface area that can be grown on. So in an ideal experiment where we don't lose any particles to the filter. Perhaps we would see uh, a smaller final part particle size than this, 125 microns. Uh, we're currently looking at a way to, to redesign this experiment to try to minimize fouling, which would give us a clear understanding of, of how strong of an effect that uh, shear induced nucleation on the fluid is really playing. Now let's wrap up by talking about the scale-up of the process, and uh, I'll give some acknowledgments, and uh, I'll be on the line to take any questions you might have. So when we were first looking at scale-up of this wet mill during crystallization process, we had quite a few concerns on our mind, and I talked about this a bit earlier, and a lot of these concerns really were hinging on that fact that there is not really a linear scale down approach to this uh, with with the wet mill because because of that centrifugal pump action even the smallest mill that we could use in the lab were still like very oversized compared to to what we have at, ma at manufacturing scale and the Im implementation of the stop start mill cycle versus that we would do at at scale we were worried about if those things are really going to translate well, or are we going to miss something by starting and stopping, uh, not being able to run continuously? Uh, but as we characterize it and gain an understanding of the process and, and came to that key, real key realization that I talked about uh, a few slides ago, that it's really the surface area being generated by, by that nucleation event, we became a lot more confident in our ability to not have issues at scale because it, it was showing that it's not really the the cumulative mill time or or how much you're milling it's really as long as that mill was going to produce that seed bed to grow on uh, we should be fine so we were, we were fairly confident that that we would be okay with this approach and here you can see the two particle size final particle size distributions of the particles we created at lab scale and then at pilot scale and so you can see 57.3 versus 57.7 .7. uh, to me that's pretty much the exact same particle size so we had really really good scale up success with this uh, and the the, um, the picture of the mill uh, next to the lab scale that that's what we use at in small scale in the labs it's called the magic lab and um, the much larger uh, manufacturing scale mill can be seen in, in the picture below. There, 
very different sizes, but essentially the same kind of mechanism happening there. Um, so this is really a success. We developed a, pro a process that can reproducibly create these 30 to 85 micron particle sizes uh, for, for proper blending. So we have blend uniformity. Uh, and and we avoided the the major line plugging issue that that was giving us a lot of a lot of problems with with the previous method of terminal wet milling. We've now run about nine or ten patches at scale, and we see this this result pretty much every time. So really, really, we're happy with with the results of, of this scale up and this process development. And quickly I'd just like to give thanks to the people on the slide as, as well as some others not on the slide that uh, from both Merck and Mettler that really made this development poss possible as well as uh, this presentation possible. So thanks. Thanks so much for listening to my presentation. Uh, I'll be on the line now to take any questions that you might have. Um, hopefully I have some answers.